Hello, my name is Ryan Sokesh, and I explore tales of urban decay. This week I've had the great pleasure of exploring Normandy, France, with three absolute experts on the topic of World War II and D-Day in particular. Today we are going to distill some of what we saw to the most simplistic points with our guest, Paul Woodage. Hi, I'm Paul Woodage. I've been living in Normandy for 20 years, coming here for 40, and I'm a battlefield guide, historian, and I just love the place. Spartacus Olsen. Uh, I'm a uh, historian specialized in the ethnic and ideological conflicts of the 20th century, but my genesis of studying history was actually here in Normandy and at the D-Day Memorials when I was only eight years old. And the one and only Indy Nidell. As the researcher, writer, and host for first The Great War and now the regular episodes of World War II in real time, my specialty is taking the tactical, strategic, and operational action in the various battlefields around the world and tying them to the geopolitical and economic shifts and events to present the wars in a globe, from a global and holistic perspective. Gentlemen, we saw a lot this week, and I would like to start with a very general consensus, your personal opinion, about what D-Day actually means in the context of history. Maybe Spartacus? start us off? Well, it's a pivotal moment because uh, it shifts the public perception of the world away from that the uh, Second World War might be a victory for fascism and Nazism. Um, it also has, and, and, and Ian Paul are going to get into that, it has military aspects and, and geopolitical aspects that are, are equally important. But to me, that is really what stands out. Um, it was a the beginning of victory. It was nowhere close to victory, but it was the beginning of victory against Nazism. <clears throat> and also, in itself, it was a pivotal moment in media history, and that really is often overlooked, because the moment the soldiers landed here on the beach, they were accompanied by embedded journalists that had been under embargo for several months, actually, that were not allowed to talk about it, but they were taken in by Shaif, the Allied command, um, and informed of what was going to happen and what was going on. And we had some big names here, like even Hemingway was, he was, uh, he was, he was not on the beaches on D-Day, but he came in the day after and he was in a boat outside. Of and then he was in the beach. bars. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, always. Um, and the way this story spread, it was really the first time in world history that a global geopolitical event was followed more or less in real time. So the story broke already from Germany, actually, at 6.30 in the morning, 6.38 in the morning. Uh, the German press agency uh, put it on their ticker. And from there on, it just spread th through the world. So by, the, by 7 o'clock in the morning, most people were aware that the landings had happened. It took a long time before they saw the real story. What's interesting about that is also that it's the beginning of embedded journalism that is then tolerated by the actual fighting forces in a way that they were not just, just the propaganda arm. However, it was still very, very skewed. It was uh, put towards the direction of sending a message that the Allies wanted to send. And this really catapulted the world into two paths that were really important. One was the victory against Nazism, and the other one was the beginning of global military or war journalism that we see today still being under attack in many ways. But in Vietnam, we saw the effects of that when it turned the tide of the war because they were reporting on the war in a very open and free way, which they weren't able to do here. But that was really relevant. I mean, even Anne Frank writes in her diary about how she's following the events of this day and the hope that it brings to her. Tragically, a hope that will never be fulfilled, but her hope that day is, she writes it straight out, maybe we will be free by Christmas. Amazing. So it's, you might even say that those first steps towards victory were the most courageous. Yes, without a doubt. That, that, yeah. Paul? So as the, as the Brit here, I think it's, it's the culmination of everything the Allies have learnt so far. So it's, it's Torch and Husky all coming together, the amphibious landings that have gone with varying levels of success. But this is putting everything that has been learnt into, into practice and making sure all those lessons are, are 
together and come together for that purpose of defeating the Germans. But also, again, as the Brit, it's banishing the ghosts of, of Dunkirk, Dieppe for the Canadians as well. No matter how many successes we'd had elsewhere, and I say we, speaking as the Brit, you know, there are successes already by June 1944, but until we Brits have set our foot, feet back in France, it still seems like we're losing. Those ghosts are still haunting us. So for me, that's, that's another big part of it as well, is that we're finally back where we were four years earlier, and that's, that's big. When you asked me that question, if you had asked me that this time last week, I would have a different answer that I have now. Because if there's one thing I've seen here, and a lot of that is because of our conversations with Paul, over the years, what D-Day means to individuals and cultures and the world in general has changed. The perspective of what it was, uh, the perspective of victory or disaster or what and who, and even the events and the things that happened, even by the people that were there, has changed. So I'll have to answer this question from my channel perspective, meaning that I'm in 1944 and I have no idea what's going to happen next year, let alone 80, 90 years in mm -hmm. the future. What it... In one single word, which he's already said, but I'm going to say I emphasis, in one single word, it means hope. It means hope for, sure, they were in Italy. The Allies were in Italy. They were back on the European continent. They were very slowly moving up the Italian continent, which, when you think of it from the outside, you think, but we have way more people in there. Italy is really tiny. How come we can't beat them there? We're finally back on Western Europe, which to, well, the British and the Americans and the Canadians really was the main, it's the, that's where you want to be. That's the main front. That's what we, we learn in schools, right? That really was hope. And it wasn't just the Western world. You had, this news was being pumped out in China. This news was being pumped out in the South Pacific and in Africa, in imperial and colonial possessions, in independent possessions. And it really was hope that this was actually going to end is actually going to end without the continuing, well, the atrocities that he covers, the day-by-day yeah. -day atrocities. Yeah. The world is always going to have atrocities. They are. It is. Um, I mean, even but the not Soviet like, Union covered it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, so, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what I say now. I might not have said that last week. So. Well, this, this loss of life, as someone who's come here kind of through virgin eyes, you gentlemen are very well studied on the topic, and I'm learning as I go. I expected to visit Omaha Beach and stand there as a place of calm reverence, maybe feel some sadness. And yet I saw buoys to guide recreational boats. I saw people playing on the beach. Uh, France memorialized these places, but it doesn't feel like a place of loss or sadness. This is the strongest contrast that I've come across. So I'd like to discuss the actual reality behind the loss of life. In your opinion, was it worthy for the cause? And was it as bad as it's been portrayed to be through media and pop culture? Maybe, Paul, you have something to say on that? Well, the simple answer is yes. The, 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 the price paid on D-Day was absolutely worth it for the result of establishing that beachhead yeah. and building everything from that beachhead. And they were under the anticipated losses quite dramatically in terms of the airborne forces. Lee Mallory had said, you know, I think 70% of all airborne forces will be killed before hitting the ground, not even to enemy action, just the air accidents. And it wasn't anything like that. So they are acceptable. To, to build on your point, one of the things we didn't do this week is we didn't really spend any time at the cemetery. So I think the, the French, the people of Normandy, they, they separate their different emotions. So the beach is somewhere to think about that first step towards the end of the war and the defeat of the Nazis, but the cemeteries stop at the deaths of the people who, who, who paid that price. So that's where you go and you doff your cap and you lay your flowers and there's a waiting list to adopt graves at the American cemetery, for example, which is, is really important. So I think there is, there's both celebration, memorialization, remembrance, all happening at the same time, and just study. Study of the battlefields is also happening. There are museums where people just go to, to look at what does that tank, tank do and what does that tank do and how does this machine gun differ from that one. That's okay as well. So all these worlds are in the same place. And, and to me, that's, that's important. Indy? You know, you got me thinking with that question um, because 
when thinking of the way it's memorialized by by the French and stuff, and it is. It is not, as you say, it is not so somber. There are people out on the beaches and people like that. Which is in real contrast to Verdun, which is also obviously a major historical importance to the French. But you go to Verdun, you go to Fleury, you go to Fort Douaumont, and it is much more somber, much more reflective. Um, I can only guess or theorize the answer to why that is. Perhaps this is because this directly led to the liberation of France, mm. whereas that was the standing and stopping point, which indirectly was a turning point a couple of years later to the ending of that war. And also, well, this is also in more living memory, but still, I think it, it'll have to do with something like that. But I can only speculate. That's a very interesting question because I hadn't thought about that before. Was the sacrifice worth it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Spartacus? More sacrifice would have still been worth it. Yeah. Total sacrifice would have been worth it. With that last point that Andy made, that if the sacrifice was worth it, and Paul said it as well, I think we're all three in, in absolute agreement of that. There's no question. Um, I would add to what you guys said um, that there is a kind of embedded problem with all of this that is very French. Um, it's not unique to France. It, it, it applies to all occupied territories. But after the war, it was very hard to reconcile the fact that there was both resistance and collaboration within the occupied nations. France was quite extreme in that way because it had a very collaborationist uh, government who, who did a lot to help the Nazis, to not say that they were an ally of the Nazis, which I would say they were because they fought against the free French and against sure. the allies in, in the colonies. And this led to, you had to do something about it. And therefore, France turned towards an idea that all of France was a den of resistance. We historians that study French history in some way call it résistantisme, which was a, a phrase coined in the 80s, which basically means, well, everybody was in the resistance. So, you know, there's nothing to, nothing more to say. France was yeah. resistance. But that's obviously not true. The French resistance had at its peak, which is about this time, uh, 44 in, in, in the war, it counted about half a million uh, active operators. Most of those were actually not active because most of those were supportive in some role. So we're counting a very small group of people compared to the population that was actually part of the resistance in any way. It's taken us over 70 years to to try to start resolving that conflict and it really only began in the early 90s yeah. when we started really discussing it openly well wait a minute that it's not that's not what happened something else <coughs> happened and, and the open discussion is still ongoing definitely not over and the monuments here follow the same kind of path uh, when i came here the first time ago uh, 40 years ago, well, yeah, 45 years ago, actually. When I came here the first time 45 years ago, um, there was no such discussion to be had. That, that didn't exist. So there were only two narratives. It was, or three narratives. It was the great adventure of liberating France, the aid given by the resistance, and memorializing the dead Allied soldiers. And note that I say Allied soldiers, because that's exactly what it was. German soldiers, you didn't talk about those. French civilians that suffered under this, you did not talk about that. Yeah, sure. The conflict that was going on between some French people who were actually on the German side, you definitely did not talk about mm. that. But now, 45 years later, we're having those discussions. And I think, to me and to my topic of history, these are the most important parts of actually creating a situation where we can memorialize this in the correct way. And for all its, in all its beauty, ugliness, heroism, and cowardice, all of those need to be talked about. Yeah. And I think we're getting there. We're not there yet, without a doubt, not there yet, but we're getting there. It is now possible to talk about the tragedy of the French civilian losses. You're allowed to do that. You were yeah. not allowed to do that 45 years ago. But Spartacus, don't you think it's a little bit easy to speak about sacrifice on the other side of victory when your grandfather or father clearly wasn't the one to have gone? You mean for me personally? For example, yeah. yeah. Well, no, because, I mean, at the end of the day, this was a global conflict, and, and I'm a perfect example of that. My, my family lived in Sweden at this time. Sweden was neutral. 
but my grandfather, for instance, was one of the few uh, that saw active service in yeah. Sweden. He was on the border, on the Norwegian border, f- fighting the partisans. I always kept on telling you, so you were on the German side. And he said, no, 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 no. But, but that, I mean, that, we, we, the West Indian guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sort of. So, so but, but, I mean, it was a global conflict. It yeah. impacted us all, from Vladivostok to San Francisco, right? This, this conflict, or to Hawaii, if you like, from Vladivostok to Hawaii, that way around, yeah. you know, this was truly a global conflict. And we see that today. I mean, there are multiple studies that prove conclusively that the suffering of World War II was passed on to the next generation and the generation after that in a way that can only almost be described as genetically. Yes. So we have the Holocaust, Holocaust victims they were the ones who were studied most about this. Their great-grandchildren, their grandchildren, are still dealing with the trauma sure. that their ancestors went through. Yeah. And that goes for all of us. So, and this kind of brings me to the final point, and I think we're going to get back to this in other ways, but it makes the D-Day memorials a really, really important place. Because this is a focal point. I'm not going to say that it was the most important thing in the war because it wasn't. There were so many important points in the war and you guys can explain that much better than I can. But the focal point that it became on that day remains the focal point that we have here around us, right? <clears throat> that does distort the story a little bit, but it gives us closure. Mm. It's, it's, it's the kind of thing that we need in order to, to, to process the enormity of what we went through. And, and that then so and and back to your last point, I'm, I'm gonna cut short now, but to your point, there are people walking on the beaches and whatnot. Yes, but this is in the middle of life. This is an area this the, the, this is exactly that is what we were fighting to save. Indeed. And since we're fighting to save that, they should not, they cannot, they must not be separated. Indeed. Well, one of the things that stirred me most was a conversation we had with one of your colleagues, another uh, French tour guide, who lives here and regards the bunkers on the beach as uh, you know, heinous German Nazi leftovers, more or less. And that if the French could finance it, many people would agree to rid the land of those bunkers. I'm curious, what stood out most in your mind? What stirred you? the most on your visit here. Indy? What stirred me the most? Probably the first five minutes overlooking Omaha Beach. And that's for a very simple reason. This is my first trip to Normandy. Which is funny, because I've been in France a lot. I am a World War guy. You'd think I would have had the time to go to Normandy before, but you'd be wrong. Um, But it was the first, my first step at any of the locations. And we walked out there and it was low tide, and all the stuff that I'd been reading and watching and listening to and writing about over the years suddenly clicked into visual, visual and cartographic place within my mind as reality instead of just conceptual reality that you sure you can still write about and still theorize about. But those first five minutes, and especially since I just because of logistical things, I barely slept the two nights before. Yes. So I was exhausted. That's a come fact. Come out there. I know I gotta work. I gotta turn it on. And just before Paul starts talking, looking out over there, that was dead. That was that really was it. I was just in the right mood to have that epiphany to see to to make this as real as as places like like the Asanzo and Verdun and Przemysl and all the other places sure. to, as become real when you see them. I would suggest for anyone who's interested, not just in, in Normandy or D-Day or World War II, but in any aspect of any war, to do your reading, do your research, and really go boots on the ground. Like when we were in, in Sedan and seeing, seeing those bridges and seeing that the French history books are actually wrong, that they, <laughs> that they were blown. You know, it, just, <clears throat> it's, it makes such a huge difference. And it really was those, just from those first few minutes. The rest of the week has followed since then, but that really was it for me. Paul, I'd like to modify this question slightly for you because you've seen these sites a thousand times over. Is there anything that still stirs you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if if I didn't have the the emotional reaction to visiting those places, I would 
I would stop it tomorrow because you realize it no longer affects me. But I actually will answer the question you asked Indy because what I enjoyed, maybe that's not the right word, is talking to people who understand Normandy in the context of the much wider operations because a lot of the people who visit here today, they are aware on some level about D-Day, Save Me Pratt, Ryan, video games, so-and-so, but sure. they can't necessarily connect that with what's happening on the Eastern Front and Bagration or what's happening in the Pacific Islands, whatever. But obviously these two gentlemen and yourself can do all that. So I, I felt it was fantastic to just connect all those things that I have been trying to do for a long time to remind people this is happening and this is happening. Um, I'm also still, just going back to a previous question, you asked about the importance of D-Day. I wish people would ask about the importance of the Battle of Normandy because I think those two have become separated. Yeah. And when D-Day, in fact, is the first chapter of the greater Battle of Normandy and the memorialization that Sparty talks about is happening so much along the beaches. If you look at the number of monuments going up yearly on the beaches to the paratroopers, to the airborne, to the commandos, that, that line is rising faster than the memorials inland to talking about the events of late July, early August, where there are still monuments going in, but not at the same rate. So... Uh, I'd like to, to move on to more understanding of the Battle of Normandy with D-Day being a step of that because I think that's a, that's a dangerous thing to, folk, to think that at the end of June they say, well, that's it then, it's, we're done, we're in. And we are, we are. The army, the army has achieved its beachhead to nearly 100%, 90% of its intentions. But there's a massive, great 76-day campaign to go on against a very stubborn, very entrenched enemy with terrain that is less than ideal for the Allies and indeed the Germans. And so that the Battle of Normandy, I think, is more um, appropriate to be talking about. Yeah. Although D-Day is the label, D-Day is the brand, isn't it? That's yeah. the thing. It's the focal point. It's, right? the, it's, yeah. the, it's the, the way singer. in. It's the, yeah, it's the lead singer. Kenny Marvel. Kenny Marvel. <laughs> yeah. But you got him. You got, you got him. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Spartacus, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, again, I've, I've been here many times. Not Nowhere close as many as Paul, of course, but I've been here many times. <clears> and what stirred me the most on this trip is how I managed to find new things again that, that kind of make me go wahoo uh, in understanding what, what happened that day uh, and it's a little bit on the level of what, what Indy experienced with Omaha uh, and that was when we sent your drone up and we got the corridor shot where the 21st Panzer went. Yeah, that down. was epic. That was a great moment. It was yeah, a great that, moment. I was <laughs> cat with two tails then. Yeah, I mean, for, that was amazing. For, for, for the viewers here, this is, this is extremely detailed, extremely nerdy stuff, but it has big consequences. So what we did was that we managed to find a way to illustrate why the 21st Panzer went the way they did in the counterattack that happens late in the day. I'm not going to tell the story. You're going to have to watch the program to, to, to get the story. But what it shows me is, from a perspective of a historiographer, which I am mainly more than I am a historian, there is still a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. to illustrate the details of this and essential details of this that really changes the narrative of the day not alters them or revises them in a revisionist way, but, but gives deeper understanding of why things went the way they did and how important that is to, to humanity at the end of the day. And that, that was a, I mean, it was an amazing moment. I, I, we were both, we were, we were screaming like little children. Was, I'll, really I'll admit it. <laughs> it was frightening. <laughs> uh, can I add something to this? Of course. Um, <clears throat> anyone who's watched my stuff knows that I talk about local terrain and its effect on on various battles and even meteorology and, and the geology of islands or swamps or desert warfare or whatever and specials on that and every time I have been on location it's to somewhere that I knew in advance what a vital role the terrain played in the campaigns that played out there like like in Poland around Przemysl and of course the Asanzo River yeah. 12 battles there but and obviously, terrain always plays a role, but I didn't until I could see it myself. I didn't realize what a vital role the terrain played in just the D-Day landings and moving inland, and of course, 21st Panzer and stuff like that. To see that and see, ah, uh, you know, the the hedgerows and things like that, which you, you hear about them, but yeah. So that that was uh, that was a big takeaway as well for me this week, and that's something that's going to really come out strongly in the in the special, which it does in in all of my stuff, but. 
but that's yeah more strongly than i i ever imagined it would fantastic listen if you guys had a dollar for every time i was corrected with a misconception on this trip you wouldn't need your patrons, I suppose. Don't that, tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> it's that, virtual dollars in me. Uh, oh, crypto. Okay, <laughs> cool. Wow. That being so said, nowadays. we now have an opportunity to just cut and clear, address the misconceptions that people have about D-Day. I think there's only one man that's going to feel that question, and he's sitting over the end there. Can you, I mean... Paul would add. I mean, there's where do we start? There's lots of them, aren't there? They're, 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 and they they go from the little things about crickets and crickets sounding like K98 rifles and things from the movies, right up to the 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 idea of Omaha being substantially worse than the other four beaches, which is something that I'm have been fighting for the last few years. And there isn't anything contemporary written at the time stressing that Omaha is anything other than a landing beach like the other four and that's something I fight and um, and we'll be talking about Bocage during these shows as well and 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 I often say to people when we talk oh the Bocage was was terrible wasn't it I said yes it was but also what terrain could the Allies have fought through that would be better what would be the perfect one choose one to be here and how would that make it better because whatever terrain there is there's the sixth Falchemega third Falchemega Das Reich um, Panzerlehr they're going to make hard uh, fighting wherever they are, whether it's open ground or hedgerows. So there's lots of misconceptions that need addressing and it's, it's, it's fun to be part of the process. Well, one thing that, that you pointed out, which was very, very interesting because it's very true, is that the myths and misconceptions aren't always the same decade after decade. You know, yeah. you have a period in the 80s when the <clears throat> perceptions of D-Day and the myths around D-Day were substantially different from what they are today. Yeah. Um, all of which you'll get you know, when you watch our extravaganza. Yeah. And I mean, I think that, that, I mean, I've been talking a lot about focal points, like in, in the past uh, few minutes. Um, I mean, in, in, first of all, I mean, let's take the Bocage as an example. I was very careful in phrasing my entry for you to say Bocage, pointing out that it presented advantages and disadvantages and that it's not the clear story that we've all been told. Right. Uh, so, I mean, that's an important part. I think what I'm saying with that is, you know, nothing is black and white in a war situation, mm. and definitely not in a complicated war situation like this one. There's also going, there was always going to be nuances that get lost. However, if we go back to remembrance, you know, this is storytelling. Um, people don't have time to become us, right? We, we dedicate our lives to this. Yeah. We, we, you know, people have jobs, they have, have uh, families, they have homes to clean, you know, uh, this is... Are you are saying we're obsessed? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> is a polite way of saying we're... <laughs> they talk about this off camera. I mean, it never ends. Well, no, I'm, I'm yeah, saying that we're fortunate. Fortunate, <laughs> fortunate. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying we're fortunate. We get paid to do something that we're fascinated by and that that, that is, you know, we've... we've, we've but it's not just fascinating, it's increasing the general knowledge. It's the part that really, otherwise, we would just sit at home and read yeah, about absolutely. it. Absolutely, that's what I was going to say. And we're, we're, We have the <coughs> privilege of being able to share that and to actually do all the work that people don't have time to do. Now, you might call it sloppy or whatever, what, 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 what have you, but the Church Tower Parachutist story, uh, saint marie Église, we're going to cover this in the episodes, of course, you know, it does serve. Yeah. I'm a believer. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Oh, Just I, joking. I, 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 <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 for the record, I, I don't like this thing, right? I'm just taking it as an example of something that, that serves a purpose, right? So this is a story <clears throat> that we agree is at best grayscaled, uh, probably just totally skewed, right? Yeah. Uh, but it pulls people to saint mer Église, and it's a place where they can kind of get a focal point and understand what was going on all around it. While as if you go to La Fierté, which we were at uh, just before that, and you have people stand there in the middle of a field, they're going to go, what the hell am I doing here, yeah. right? I don't understand this field. Well, to us, in our inner minds, we have like a virtual reality show going yeah, on. And it's where, more important where, than some magazines. Yes, of course <laughs> it is. And we see everything around us. We go, oh, wait a minute, that was over there. And, and yeah. we get it, right? Yeah. But there are no structures. It's just trees and, and grass and, and, and rivers. And, you know, so 
this is why the myths arise and it is what we can do with the myths. However, and this is where I'm going to get into like a little bit of a future outlook on where the monuments in, in, in Normandy need to go. With modern technology, we could make La Fierté really an exciting place because with superimposed, like if you put a pair of glasses on and you yeah. see where yeah. everything yeah. happened, sure. you don't need the myths anymore. You don't need the parachutist. And, and you don't need the parachutist doll hanging in the, in the, in the tower. And that is what really makes us fortunate because that's part of what we're forging here. We're creating yeah. online content that becomes accessible to people so that we can do the digestion of all of these amazing details down to a level where it becomes, hopefully, understandable. I think in, like, <coughs> on a <coughs> rising scale of, of detail, uh, it might be difficult. We face challenges with that, but, but that is our job. That is yeah. what we do. And that is a privilege that we have to share these things and to dispel the myths, not because we're myth busters. Who cares? That's not the point. Yeah. But because we can actually teach people what really happened, right? Yeah. Or our best knowledge, at least, of what really happened. <coughs> nope. You're clearing my throat. It's cold out here. <laughs> <coughs> Indeed it is. One of the jarring things we saw was a remnant of the Atlantic Wall. And it was jarring to me because it was a little more ramshackled than I would have thought it to be. The image of the Nazi war machine was always so powerful and potent. You know, they came into Poland and just annihilated. The French surrendered. Which leads me to a curiosity about what weaknesses within the German Nazi regime actually helped with the success of the Allied invasion. It's kind of a hole with no bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the Wehrmacht in 1944 was not the same thing as the Wehrmacht in, say, 1941. However, just because it was not uh, the same thing, the same strength, the same equipment, does not mean it was not a formidable fighting force. The thing is, in 1944, you have other formidable armies, you have better equipped armies, you have larger armies, right? So this all plays a part. Now, talking about just the Atlantic Wall, yeah, the, the, there was a lot of German propaganda about its invincibility and its strength. Of course, the, the Germans were great at propaganda. Say what you will. <laughs> no, don't. Please. Actually, leave that in. Um, but um, the Atlantic Wall was ne never became what it was fully sp supposed to become. And even by the fall of 1943, so even like six months before D-Day, it was mainly concentrated around the ports. It was really, I mean, Directive, Fuhrer Directive 40 uh, really established the idea of building the Atlantic Wall, but the Fuhrer Directive 51 in early November 1943 was the really get this done because we can let things slide on the east for now because we can give up tons of land on the east and still be who we are, but we cannot give up the West. So this was the focus on the West um, directive. And in fact, it gave all the departments, and it was to all the departments, until the 15th of November, so only like less than two weeks, to say specifically what they have done, what they are going to do. Mm -hmm. And this is when it really began to move away from, from the ports. But that's only six or seven months before D-Day, even if, even if it was a, a still the well-oiled logistical machine that it had never quite been what people think, but still better than it was in 1944, they wouldn't have been able to do as much as they claimed they were doing to build this wall. It's just, it's not humanly possible for, for any nation to do that. I mean, it takes concrete 28 days to set. Mm. So, you yeah. know, at the time they didn't have <clears throat> speed concrete. So it, just that, just that puts one month for every section you build out. And there you go. Amazing. Paul, I saw you nodding your head over there. Oh, well, German concrete, Atlantic Wall, weaknesses, it's um, right up my street. Um, <laughs> there's, there's just a whole sub-industry of books and magazines of almost bunker worship. Uh, of, and they always have the big impressive ones. They have the U-boat pens on the front, front and the big guns up near Calais. And they don't tend to have all the ones that, as you said, are in the dilapidated condition that have fallen off the edge of cliffs and that, that weren't finished. And it's important to get across that when books and historians talk about, well, what if they had built more of this? What if Rommel had got his way and they'd finished off that, finished off this? The deterioration of build quality was dramatic by 44. I love showing people how effectively 
better than 1942 bunkers were because they were using better materials, better workers, the cement was better, the, the wood shuttering they had to make the forms. And then by 44, the work, worker um, ability has dropped, the, the getting of wood to the coast has is impossible the cement quality is down the uh, and everything is just poorer and poorer so even if the allies had given the germans another six months as you said they're indie it's six months that they can't go back in time to the peak of 42 when they had the ability to build the stuff at the proper level and they've been building it under the um the allied bombardments and the allied all that as well so I think we need to uh, remind ourselves that the Atlantic Wall, this much vaunted Atlantic Wall, that was a massive drain on German resources, Third Reich resources that could have gone elsewhere, it didn't work. It lasted minutes on some of the beaches, pretty much, hours elsewhere, and then it's gone. It's, it's, it's just, it's a complete folly. And yet, sometimes these books suggest that, look at this incredible set of defences, and it, it, it wasn't. Spoiler alert, it wasn't, because it didn't work. That's and let's, clearly wait, and let's also not forget that there was, even the resources that there were, there was some serious misallocation of resources. The Channel Islands took up like 15% oh of yeah. the entire budget for the Atlantic Wall, because that was to make a statement, because those had been British. Sure. That was, they were so incredibly well fortified, it, it just didn't even bother attacking, it just went around them. So, it, you know, and that's a huge amount of money that could have been spent elsewhere. Yeah. So. And I mean, what strikes me with that, when we're talking about things that don't work, which is a fortified line, it's the exact opposite of the Maginot line in 1940, which was a formidable defense yeah. line. Defense system. Defense system, yeah, thank you. Uh, but, and it, it was only overrun, not because they actually smashed it or smashed through it or went around it. as you can't go says. around it. It's impossible. Because it goes from long, the channel right? down to the Mediterranean. It, it, it was only broken through because the French general Hunziger let them through. Oh, okay. That's the they only way. And here... It we might have well through. have been broken through anyway. Yeah, okay, that's sure, possible. Sure. But, sure. but I mean, yeah, let's let's face that it took them a whole day and a whole division to destroy just one fort. And that fort was isolated and surrounded, which it wouldn't have been if it sure. would have stood. And it was never meant to stand more than three weeks anyway. That, that was, was the, the idea. It was, was a, delaying, a delaying. And here we have a completely different situation. And why I'm bringing that up at all is because the Maginolan had been built on for close to a decade, not quite a decade, but it would be more than half a decade. They'd been building on that line, and here they had six months to complete something that was already, in and of itself, not really complete. So that's an important factor. But what I think is much more important at this point is the moral, financial, and human resources bankruptcy that Germany is facing in June 1944. Mm. Um, <clears throat> They fought a war for for uh, four years, for five years almost, coming up on five years, um, that has drained the resources of Germany to a point of absolute destitution. And it's not the bombing of the cities, it's not anything in that direction that has done it. It's simply the fact that we're talking about a population of 65 million people taking on a fight of over a billion people that it's as simple as that that's the math we're, we're facing so at this point you know they have the germans have realized that their system has failed it's come to the point of where the generals has, have realized that the system has failed and there's only one person who is absolutely adamant about doing this the way they did it and that is Adolf Hitler. Hitler. Amazing. So all of the generals are doing something else and even the ones like Rommel mm. who is on paper doing what Hitler told him, is not really doing what Hitler told him because he's got other ideas. Rundstedt is sitting in Paris and he's and he's a super Nazi, so it's not an ideological issue. He's just lost complete faith in everything that the Führer is doing. So he's kind of just shrugging his shoulders going, well, I don't care because what, I can't do anything. We're, we're lost. So, so there's a... And then comes the whole thing about the, the, the idea of that Germany is not the good guy in this war has penetrated into the minds of every single soldier, every single human being in Germany, and the morale is at an absolute low. Again, not because of the Allied bombings or anything like that, but because they're really starting to see what the Nazi regime has done to them, to other people, and whatnot. And morale is extremely low. 
and then and that is symbolized by that come that all comes together here at D-Day, where over forty percent of the soldiers fighting on the German side are not German. Mm-hmm. Some of them yeah. are some of them are even forced conscripts out of the Red Army. <clears throat> And they're actually giving up on this day, many of them. Some of them, like the Georgian cavalry, fight fiercely, yep. and they stand up to it. But then we have the story in the, near Miaville where a, um, a squadron of, of Polish Germans who did not want to fight for the Nazis but were forced to do it, and they had a sergeant who was their guard. Instead of fighting, they decide to just shoot their sergeant and give up. So you got a situation of complete utter moral and financial and human resource bankruptcy that is trying to face one of the best equipped yeah. one of the best <laughs> best soldiered armies of the world so you know so tell me Spartacus if the German Nazi downfall was eminent it was coming the allies must have realized that the Red Army must have realized that did D-Day have anything to do with a race to Berlin no uh, and yes, but <laughs> depends really who you ask in the armies. Yes. Yeah. So, so let's take that from a, a high command level and and ignore and and then disregard that Churchill and Roosevelt had some different ideas on this, and I'm sure that Stalin and Molotov have some had some different ideas on this, and they all had different ideas on what was going on here. But if we look at the lowest common denominator, the answer is no. If we look at detailed parts of the ideological war that's going on in the background, the answer is yes. So Churchill, for instance, was kind of pushing for that kind of idea, right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that, yeah. There's no question. But that's a sideshow. It's a total sideshow. From a military sp- perspective, this has to happen. Mm-hmm. The Russian counteroffensive is frozen. Now, Stalin rather... Well, in a bit of spite, I think, refuses to launch Bagration uh, at the same time as they launch Overlord, but that's a detail. He, he can't l- launch it without Overlord. If Overlord doesn't happen, the Soviets cannot begin their big sweep into Germany. Vice versa, if Bagration doesn't start, the, yeah. the, oh, yeah. the Overlord's in big the, trouble. Overlord is done, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it is not a race to Berlin. It is the necessary pincer to crush the German army between them. It's like because the biggest despite, operational yeah, pincers in history. Yes, yeah. <laughs> because if I, if I, despite what I just said about moral bankruptcy, that does not mean that the Nazi German armies do not have fight in them. There is still a lot, and again, contrary to popular belief, they have not been depleted. Their factories are still churning out planes, cannons, tanks, ball everything. Bearings. Ball bearings, lots of them. They're coming out because they put them underground. They put slaves in these factories, and they're just pumping it out. They're having difficulties putting it to the front because the Allies are getting better and better, both from the air, the partisans, and everything to destroy the supply lines, which were already stretched. So sure, that is all difficult. But they're still there, and they're still a big army, and they're yeah. still an army with and a lot of supply lines within in Germany yeah. were a less stretched than those in, in the Soviet Union. So, so the further yeah. you get, the better supplied they are. But these perspectives are very interesting. If we bring it to the modern day, for example, the current fascist Russian government is pushing a narrative that the Eastern Front was the only one that actually mattered. What are your feelings on that? Wait, wait. Eastern Front was the only one that mattered in the European War, in World War II as a whole, in the 20th century. What, where, where does fighting that sentence Nazism. finish? I mean, fighting what they Nazism. say is in fighting Nazism. Okay. This is the only, no, only one. I mean, the, the, the line that the FSB is pushing, you've seen mm-hmm. it under your videos, we've seen it under our videos. Yeah, yeah. The line they're pushing is that this was a sideshow. Uh, the only thing that really counted was the Eastern Front. That's where the war was won. They could have done it without D-Day. Like I said, they couldn't have. It's a problematic narrative, um, you know. In Italy too, hell. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's a, it's a problematic narrative. It's a narrative that, that, of course, is absolutely unacceptable. But it's a narrative that has its roots in the Cold War because, uh, you know, when we were isolated from each other, these two uh, parts of the world. So we had the communist system in the East and we had the free market economies of the West, um, that, you know, those those narratives were already there. Mm-hmm. So the Great Patriotic War it was already shortly after the war, the only one that was celebrated in the Soviet Union. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Operation Overlord, uh, more than Anzio, but Anzio as well, were the things that were celebrated here in, in, in Western Europe. 
We see it in my line, which is the concentration camps. So the Soviets really didn't want to talk about the extermination camps because the extermination camps destroyed the narrative that it was mainly Slavs who were the victims of uh, Nazi aggression. Uh, and it gets very complicated. I'm not going to get into that. You can watch my series to understand how wrong that is because, yes, they were very much the victims, but the main victims were and remain the Jews. That's just, that. that is how it is, and you can't put it in any other way. Right. And um, the Western part of the world kind of stayed with the real story in a much bigger way, but they didn't want to talk about how much the Red Army POWs were starved to death and the Slavs were actually victims of the Holocaust. So we got two conflicting narratives with that. In the Soviet Union, they played the game that the Nazis had started to play. So all of the extermination camps that ended up on their side, which were the worst ones, if we're talking about, you know, Treblinka, Sobibor, Vevchech, yeah. they, they ended up in Soviet uh, uh, occupied Poland and then communist Poland and only one really ended up on the western side and that is Auschwitz and to this day we remember Auschwitz as the symbol of the worst mass we murder in, in history but it was the smallest extermination camp because the other ones were the biggest ones mm. so this dichotomy goes on to this day and that applies just as much to the example I now took in my field to the field that the gentlemen here are focusing on, which is the actual Western and Eastern Front, where we see them coming up with this narrative. What troubles me about it is that we spent the last 30 years walking away from that divided narrative and trying to begin to find a cohesive view on the war where we really understand it from its global perspective. And Putin's, Putin's concerted effort to revive the Soviet myth of the great patriotic war damages us. It, it sounds it like a very dangerous the world thing. And it damages our field, which is the historiography of this conflict. So it's something that has to be fought with, with, with all might that we have. We have to try to counter that narrative, not by saying, oh, it was the Western Front that mattered, but saying, no, 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 no. All no. the fronts that yes, mattered. The exactly. same as the First World yeah. War. It was, <laughs> it's, it's, they fought in all fronts. There were some that at times were more major or more active, or one might have been overall larger, and, but they all mattered. That, I mean, even the, some of the more forgotten fronts, like the Abyssinian campaign, the Syria-Lebanon campaign, they mattered. They were really important. The Abyssinian campaign, that was, that was, that was the first victory. It was, <laughs> the books about it are called the first victory because there's nothing else to call it. Um, I mean, even just the morale boost from that. After, I mean, yeah, all of them. You can't, you, can't marginalize, you can't marginalize North Africa. Or, or, or Greece, or, or even the Dodecanese. You can't marginalize those and still tell the story accurately of the war and of the enormous cooperation between partners that were diametrically opposed ideology that won the war. You yeah. can't. Well, and, and you said, about, sorry, you said about the, um, is Operation Overlord necessary? But... Operation Overlord, even for the people watching this, as soon as we say those, hear those words, we think of men running out of landing craft up those beaches or paratroopers jumping out of aircraft. But technically, that's Neptune. Ne ne Operation Overlord is the bigger, larger arrival of the Allies into Western Europe. And as part of that, just as Spartacus is saying, as the Third Reich is, is hitting the, the, the low of... of of uh, morale and they're broke, they're just destitute. The Allies haven't even peaked yet. I mean, the Allies are producing everything by greater, greater numbers. And so the Allies are working at the same time as they're planning Operation Overlord, they're doing the deception, the bombing of, of Germany is cranking up. And although that there's, there's disagreements about how it should be used and where it should be used, the keeping of the Luftwaffe in Germany to defend daily against the 8th Air Force by day, the Bomber Command by night, is keeping that Luftwaffe away from both defending the beaches, but also adding to the defense of the, the Soviets moving uh, towards Berlin. So Operation Overlord isn't just men running up beaches. That's the bit we think of as that focal point, the, the tip of the spear. But it's much greater. There's the invasion in the south of France. No one talks about that in absolutely. August. Listen, I'm absolutely guilty of this myself. The first discussion we had, I mentioned that my grandfather, he was in France, probably during D-Day. You explained to me, no, that wasn't the case. It was a small, finite, 
group of guys who came in, followed by massive waves. But I do have one last question for you about the logistics of that day. Oh, and uh, leans forward. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, yes. Oh, oh, uh -huh. okay, okay. Yeah, okay, but we're still interested. <laughs> we're still interested. The word logistic mm. triggers things yeah. in our bodies. It's like 25 pounder <laughs> from mine. <laughs> okay. You know, the, the glorified images that come to my mind with regards to D-Day are the men running up the beach and the hell that ensues. But, forgive me, when I saw the man hanging off the cathedral with his parachute, it really gave me something to think about, leading into discussions of what the paratroopers went through, just men dumping out of airplanes. Craziest thing ever. That, that actually, the more I think about it, it sounds more intense than running up the beach. At night. Yeah. Which of those two types of landing was actually more critical to the operation? Oh. You can't separate one from the other. Um, the, the, what, uh, the, that's a cop out. Well, it, it isn't a cop out. It's a, it's a, it's a correct, the correct answer. <laughs> I right? know, I mean, but it doesn't answer the, my the, question. The airborne are doing the <laughs> job enough, of holding enough, the right. flanks and the, the, to, to enable the landings on the beaches to, to, to come in. So one without the other doesn't work. It, it's, it's an aircraft with you have two wings on an aircraft, not one. So they're essential. I mean, what I to, to, to turn it back in a different way. I was on Omaha Beach a few years ago with Jim Pee Wee Martin, who died last week, a great friend of mine, G Company 506, and Harley Reynolds, who was um, uh, 16th Infantry on Omaha Beach. And they were arguing with each other who had the worst job that day, but in, in defense of the other person. So, you know, I, Harley was said, who ran up that beach into the you know, first wave on Omaha Beach, easy read, about the worst sector. I would never have jumped out of an aircraft uh, into the middle of nowhere in the pitch black. And... Jim says, well, you'd never have catch, caught me running out of, you know, sitting in a landing craft for three hours approaching a beach. I'm glad I was in control of my own destiny by jumping out of an aircraft, feeling I could steer myself to the ground to the right place. So yeah. those two couldn't decide which was worse. I know that's not the question you asked, but it is, it sort of answers it in the sense that they are both difficult, but both essential. Mm. But that's the same thing we've been saying about the entire war. <laughs> you know, sure. you can't. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. And from a memorial perspective, if we come back to it, I mean, we need to find, I mean, we talked about it the other day. Do we need a new historical canon for D-Day? And, and yes. Uh, we do, without a doubt. But, I mean, how do we forge that historical canon? Well, that's up to us historiographers. I think you're and, in the process, aren't you? Sorry, yeah, well, we are. But, I mean, that, that's not going to be enough because people do need to come here. It needs to become a visceral experience. So I come back to what I said earlier. We don't just need a new historiographical canon. We need a new method of telling that history because it cannot be told by falsely hanging a puppet yeah. from a church tower, right? Yeah. But that is, that was important because until that damn puppet ha hung up there, People were going to the beaches and talking about the landings, and they totally forgot about the 82nd and the 101st okay. and uh, the British gliders. And mm. you know, they, they, nobody talked about that. So now we got a, that focal point, but it's skewing the story in the wrong way. So we need a new way to tell this story because everything is important within it. And personally, I am firmly convinced that at some point, and I'm going to say five years, and it's going to be 25 or whatever. I don't know. I don't care how long it is, but at some point we are going to see a virtual reality or an augmented reality mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. of this day that enables us to put the focus in the right places and making the little things just as spectacular as that, as more puppet. spectacular yeah. as that damn puppet hanging up on but, the You know, Spartacus, the respectfully, and this is something I wanted to ask all of you, that war puppet might be a notion of exploitation, right? Because you're drawing tourists in, not only because you care to educate them, but because you want to sell them souvenirs, tours, uh, gadgets. But in a sense, the three of you also profit from this history. It's how you make your living. Well, if Hitler didn't exist, I would be out of a job. Indeed. It's not nice to say, but that's the truth. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Band back together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but seriously, where do you draw the line between, you know, authentic, from the heart, preservation of history and exploitation? Oh, that's a difficult another, one. Another bottomless pit, yeah, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it's that, that I mean, is, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll attempt an answer. Um, I don't think that one is possible. It's again, it's like the, uh, the air landings and the, the beach landings, you know, uh, you can't have one without the other. It's called combined arms for a reason. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then in this case, I mean, if you look at it, if we did not have the wonderful, wonderful participation of the Time Goes to Army, 
we would yeah. not be able to do what we're doing. We couldn't the be here. Same thing, yeah. f- the same thing goes for... Uh, Paul wouldn't have any monuments if it wasn't for all of the voluntary organizations that are putting these together. And all of that requires money because we all need to eat. So the fine line, I think, becomes visible only when you're in the middle of it. You have to be respectful to the history. You have to be respectful to the suffering, the sacrifice, and the gains. Because you have to be respectful to gains as well. You can overstate them or understate them. I mean, you have to like find all of those fine lines because we're talking about something that is so important to humanity that we must not forget. Yeah. I always say it, never forget. Yeah. We must not forget. We must not stop trying to understand deeper what happened during this terrible, terrible war and, and how we turned it around using both diplomacy, military might, uh, and just human industry. Re- yeah. industry, industry and human resourcefulness. If we don't look at that critically, if we don't look at that with open eyes, then we are setting us up for repeating the mistakes that were made uh, that led to that situation. So it's really important. And the industry that has grown around it, us included, is an important part of that. So you've got to find that fine line. And I think, you know, that is to a certain degree up to the educational institutions of the world. It's also up to the states of the world but more than anything, it's actually up to us, historiographers. It's, it's, we, have to, we have to make sure that the tools that we provide people with, the, the pieces of literature, of film, and, and storytelling in person that we forge fulfill those very high standards of both the educational bit and the remembrance bit. And mm. when we do that, then it falls in place. Yeah. Then it's, it's okay. I don't care if they sell dumb baseball caps with the 101st rules or whatever. That's fine. We do that as well. We, we, you know, life is not an endless walk through a valley of misery where we have to flagellate ourselves and apologize for being humans. It has to be a little bit fun. I know that Ian, standing back there somewhere... Uh, was uh, speaking about how he was taken aback when he went to a tank uh, fest in in Canada and it was sold as a barbecue for families and you know but these are horrible killing machines and I'm but you interested have to fire in the it. imagination and bring people exactly in, and, it makes and, sense. and if you say um, we're going to show you how horrible a tank is well, are any families going to come? No, they're not. Come on, if they kids. say, if we're, if we say, come on, we're going to have a nice barbecue. There's an opportunity for the children to have a little bit of fun. Then you can take that opportunity and you can talk about the actual importance of this killing machine and why it's important that we never get to use it, but it is important no. that it exists. But you can't have that conversation without the barbecue. I've never been to a place with a higher concentration of monuments. All those monuments require financing. We discussed this yesterday. I'm of the opinion that there will come a time that the financing fizzles out, that the monuments fall into oblivion, in a sense, and it will become a niche topic. Paul didn't agree with me. I don't agree. And that's fair enough. I don't agree with you either. (laughs) Fair enough. Let's check back in in 200 years, 300 years. Okay. I I, I do not believe uh, that that these monuments will, you know, uh, stand in eternity. All the same, you guys clearly disagree with me. And uh, I believe that it's important for you, as you just illustrated, that we remember. You end your episodes that way. So I ask, in conclusion, what should we remember? I mean, it's easy to say that the responses of sacrifice and duty and, and honor, and, and part of me wants to say that, but part of me wants to keep it also as a Let's keep talking about it. Let's keep picking it apart. Remember, remember that it's history is the event that has happened, but it's the understanding of it in the world we live in today. So it, it, sac- honoring the, the, the sacrifice, the loss, is only part of it. So remember the whole package. Remember that the, the o- studying of the Battle of Normandy or World War II in general is, a, is an avenue to lots of other important discussions. So remember, remember it's a starting point. Remembrance is a starting point for a greater journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, remember. A very good answer. But I would I would add to that that in the case of D-Day specifically, what is really important to remember is that the world wanted this. 
because the world needed this, because this war needed to end. And that is a really, really important point to remember. This was not a, this was not a military operation done because some leaders in their ivory tower felt that they needed to fix some geopolitical problem. It was a fight to end a war that had long, long, long gone out of complete hand. Remember that this one day out of 2,194 days of this war, that this one day really is a, a microcosm of the conflict at large, of the macro conflict. And remember that this specific one of those 2,194 days was not just a day of hope for the armies fighting, but broadcast to the world as the first really genuine day of hope for 50, 60, 70 nations, right? Remember that. Yeah, very eloquent. Guys, it's been an amazing tour. Thank you so much for this amazing talk as well. And with that, we bid the Time Ghost Army and the world alike a very warm farewell. See you next time. Never forget. Thank you.